hear me okay? She, uh, she works. Uh, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Can hear you well. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you for your time. I know some of you are uh, probably eating lunch at your screens today. Um, my name is Scott Brunstrom. I'm a federal systems engineer with Netscope. Um, with me today is uh, Brian Lee on the phone as well. And we're going to go through a few slides and then a demo on some zero trust capabilities that we have um, and uh, a couple of different use cases. Um, for those that don't know who Netscope is, I, I kind of threw in the obligatory company detail slide. A uh, couple of important pieces here um, that I typically point out are, you know, we're found in 2012, and we uh, started out focused on CASB, Cloud Access Security Broker. Um, and that allowed us to gain a lot of technology and capabilities with cloud applications today. And we'll talk a little bit about that as how it applies to Zero Trust. Um, and the other couple things here is that, you know, we're, we're doing 50 billion transactions per day. Um, we are a SASE cloud provider, if you will. Um, so, uh, you know, secure access service edge is what SASE stands for. It's a, it's a Gartner term. Um, and we're today we're going to focus mostly on CASB, DLP uh, and private access. I mean, a little bit of browser isolation, but these are all the capabilities that uh, most folks associate with a, a SASE provider. Right, so we're a born in the cloud, uh, fully cloud solution that provides these capabilities as a service to customers and, and federal agencies. Um, we, you know, we, we keep adding different capabilities as we move along. And um, for, for, for this discussion, we're really talking about zero trust, which is more uh, in our terminology, we call it private access. So you'll hear me use those two terms sort of interchangeably at times, private access and zero trust network access. Uh, but essentially the, you know, the overall goal for SASE is to be able to connect users securely, provide security services and network services to any of their applications, no matter whether they're in the cloud or whether they're in a data center or whether they're in a public cloud uh, environment as well. Uh, and we typically uh, uh, expose this to our customers as uh, the following, you see the orange boxes at the top here. Um, and we're mostly gonna talk about a little bit about Secure Gateway um, and ZTNA on the far right. Um, these are all services that we provide, typically in a subscription fashion, um, and they run on our platform, if you will. Um, our platform is based on uh, containers. It's a, it's a microservice platform that we run ourselves. We run it um, on around 50 data centers worldwide today. Um, and we call that essentially those data centers and the network that connects those data centers, New Edge. So you might hear me refer to New Edge as well. Um, I think the important part here is that you know, it's a cloud service that we can quickly um, deploy new types of security services that customers are looking for um, in a scalable method and be able to service that customer no matter where they are, right? So if you've got folks that are on the East Coast, the West Coast, um, worldwide, they can get the same security no matter where they're, whether they're sitting in an office, whether they're sitting in their home or whether they're sitting in a coffee shop somewhere. Um, and it's all done via single console, and we'll, we'll walk through that a little bit. Um, and it uh, also integrates with a lot of your on-prem solutions. So one of the things about moving security to the cloud is there's a lot of metadata that's generated. And a lot of folks have built um, entire systems around analyzing that metadata. So we, we provide capabilities to get that data back to your environments, whether it be a SOC, whether it be a SOAR, a SIM tool, um, we have integrations with Elastic and uh, applications for Splunk, as an example, um, to allow you to get access to that data in the, in the method that you're doing so today. Um, we also provide threat intel sharing as well um, through our cloud exchange um, so that uh, you can also have a, a bi-directional uh, communication of IOCs, both from the, the Netscape side and, and from the, uh, the federal side as well. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, so from an overall perspective, if we look at a web transaction or a cloud transaction, um, I wanna point out a couple things that make it important for zero trust. And probably the biggest is um, the, the, the authentication of the user and the state of the device itself, right? So 
Um, we, we integrate with different IDPs, Okta, Ping, um, ADFS, Active Directory, um, and we essentially authenticate the user or using a, 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 an authentication that's already occurred. So that way we can de determine who the user is, what groups they belong to, um, and whether they're allowed access to certain resources. Um, at the same time, we're also looking at the device itself um, so that we can see if they have the right patches, do they have the right um, antivirus or anti-malware, if they, is it up to date? And again, we use that in our policies to just decide whether we're gonna give them access to those resources or not. Um, I'm not gonna go through all these, but a couple other ones that I'll point out um, or there essentially are two other items. One is um, we actually rate the user as well as, uh, as they're, as they're um, doing their work. We, we understand where they're going, what types of risks they're taking when they go there. Um, and we develop a risk rating for the user and we can use that in policy as well. So if you've got a, a particular user that's um, often downloading large files from uh, places that aren't so secure, that rating will go down and you, you can actually um, have policy that will dynamically kick in um, at certain rating levels. The other piece um, is instance control, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in the demo, but we have the ability to look at cloud instances. We look at your version of O365, um, and we can create policies around that as well. And then the last thing I'll bring up uh, in, in this context is the content piece. So we've, a, lot, a lot of times folks will talk about zero trust network access, CTNA, or zero trust networking. Um, and that's, um, you know, sort of in its, I, I would say, infancy, we're still building solutions that are completely integrated to prevent, you know, access or control access to resources that, that we define. But there's also data as well. Um, so I think we can't leave that behind and that, you know, we also want to take the same concepts for zero trust networking and start to apply them to the data. And uh, I'll show you how we're starting to do that as well. So for this demonstration, uh, from a use case perspective, um, we kind of kind of kept it a little bit simple. Um, we're going to talk about a, a GFE laptop, essentially accessing public and private cloud applications, right? ZT, the typical ZTNA, right? I'm a I'm a user sitting on um, at home, uh, and I've got a government laptop, and I need to get to um, a private application, and then also doing remote desktop into that public and private cloud as well to gain access to a resource, um, you know, a Windows machine or a, a, a Linux machine inside uh, a private cloud or inside, a, you know, an, a, an Azure or AWS Cloud Cloud as an example. And then one of the other things we'll talk about and, and go through is um, uploading and, uh, and, and blocking sensitive data. So I'll show you how we do that. Um, in this case, we'll be using the Teams application um, but again, sort of applying or looking to apply some zero trust principles, if you will, to the data, not just to, to access as well. And then lastly, I'll, I'll show a personal laptop um, accessing a private application. So essentially the, the application of zero trust on a, uh, on a laptop or device that you don't control. Um, so for our first demo, just a real quick diagram. This is a high level. Um, zero trust network access. There's a couple of components here that I want to point out that you know to, for you to understand. Um, on the right hand side, we've got a, a public cloud applications and, and private data center applications. Um, and for ZTNA, we use something called a publisher. Those are represented by the the bluish boxes in there. We call it the Netscope publisher. And the publisher establishes a secure, authenticated connection to the Netscope security cloud. Um, to essentially your instance of the Nescope Security Cloud. Um, and it also has definitions of what applications are available um, to users uh, within it as well. We, we typically use a tool to discover those applications, or we, we can also manually um, configure them as well. And we'll go through a little bit of that. Um, on the left-hand side, we have users. And um, typically for ZTNA, we'll, we'll use an agent. So on the GFE laptop, as an example, We'll have a steering client, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So let's jump in. So here I've got um, a GFE laptop with the agent installed. 
And um, we'll take a look at the configuration of the agent because I just want to go over a, through a few components there. Um, so the agent does essentially a few things that, that are required for us to, to, to get a ZTNA connection. Number one is it establishes an authenticated connection to the Netscope Security Cloud um, for your particular tenant. So if you're in um, a particular agency, um, you, you generate a client, that client has um, keys and certificates that allow us to authenticate that that client is indeed uh, allowed access or allowed to at least create a tunnel to your instance of the Netscope Security Cloud. The other thing it does, as I mentioned earlier, is it also does checks on the client machine itself. So is it running the right version of operating system? Is it running um, antivirus or anti-malware? And if so, is it, is it up to date? Those types of things. Um, and you can also customize registry key settings looking for particular items within the actual device as well. Um, so if based on those checks, we sort of, we kind of group that device into either a managed device or an unmanaged device, and then we can create policies for both of those um, based, based on uh, what we see. Um, so the other, and the last thing that it does, it's most important really, is it steers traffic to the Netscope Security Cloud. So traffic that normally would go to the internet or normally go um, over a VPN connection if you were using VPN, um, we're actually gonna steer that to um, your instance of the Netscope Security Cloud for processing um, and rather than have it go directly to the internet. So we'll move forward here. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do really is um, I'm just gonna have the client disabled um, and we'll just ping our data center. You can see that the data centers, uh, the resources that are in the data center they're using private IP space. Well, that's, uh, and we can't, you know, we basically, we can't reach those um, from here because that, that data center is not available to the public. Um, that's one advantage to using the publisher is that we don't have to expose any external IPs or any external services um, to essentially reach those resources that we want to use within the private data center or within an AWS cloud, as an example, or an Azure uh, instance as well. So now we'll re-enable the client. You can see the icon there that the client is running. And even when we enable the client and we try to reach these devices as well, um, we can't reach them directly. It's, unlike a VPN client, we're not allowing network access to that data center. It's actually based on the application. Um, so again, we can't reach those resources, in this case, via ping and trace route because um, those are not applications that we've, we've uh, allowed. So we're gonna, first thing we'll do is we'll jump into a vCenter. My, uh, this is essentially my data center in DC. And um, as you can see, it's, a, it's on a private IP address at the top there. Um, we've logged in um, and we get the, the full experience as if we were sitting um, in my home. I'm actually doing this from Florida today or this week. Um, so again, we've uh, established a tunnel um, through the Netscope Security Cloud. We validated the client, we validated the user, and um, they, we've uh, we've looked at security, uh, the security policy, and we've allowed them access to this particular um, web application, if you will. Uh, we can do the same thing. If you notice here, there's a Windows 10 machine. Um, and um, that's, that's also in the same data center. Um, so we'll take a look. We'll, we'll also do remote access to this same device, right, or to to this Windows 10 server, I should say, in the same data center. So it's on this private IP. And then uh, I get the, I get a, a Windows login and I'm in. So basically I'm using RDP um, to, to gain access to this machine. And just again, we'll take a look at uh, we'll take a look at his IP address, and you'll see it's essentially the private subnet 
within my Maryland data center, if you will. So let's take a look at how we actually configure this. And this will kind of take a little bit of the, the mystery away about, about how this is done. Um, it's relatively straightforward. First, we're gonna go into the Netscope admin interface itself. So this is my particular instance. Um, all of us engineers have our own instance of, uh, of Netscope, but you can see at the, at the top here, it's got my particular host name in front of it. Um, and this is uh, basically, a, a, this screen is completely configurable. This is a, a home screen with, with some information on it, but we're gonna look at um, how we define a ZTNA access. And essentially the first thing we, we do typically is define the applications themselves. So we, we go here to app definition. This is a private application. Um, and as you can see here, we have a bunch of different private applications that um, I have already defined. Uh, these can be used in, that need to be used in policy later. So just by defining the application, you're not allowing any, anyone access to it, right? So essentially you're just letting the publisher know um, what applications are available. Um, and you either do this manually or we, like I said earlier, we have a tool that helps you discover private apps um, within your data center. Um, and then once you create the, the the private apps, there you saw the the Windows 10 and the and the vSphere. You actually need to create policy to allow access to those those applications. So that's what we're doing here. Um, I'm actually I create a single policy that allows access to all of those. All right, so we can do it by user. We can do it by group. Um, we can do it by IP if you really wanted to. Um, we have a couple of different methods. We have um, with the client or clientless, and we'll talk about clientless a little bit later. Um, and then uh, we have the application. So here are all the applications that I've chosen for this particular policy. Um, you can see the different applications down here. I can uh, basically check which ones I wanna allow access to. Um, for this particular user or groups. And then essentially do we allow, you know, let's allow or deny. So we create that policy and, um, and we apply it to the system and now we have the ability to, to reach those applications that we define. Now it's only, again, it only applies to your users using your agent um, from your tenant, so it's uh, secure there. So let's jump back a second and just kind of review what actually happened there. Um, so to start out, uh, we call it Netscope Private Access. I Again, I call it ZTNA a lot. Um, we kind of use those terms interchangeably. But we have a publisher in the, in the data center and it connects to the newest network or the, the Netscape Security Cloud, right? Again, using TLS 1.3, um, with the proper certificates. Um, and there's a, a little bit of other handshake that goes on underneath the covers as well. Then the client connects to the cloud as well. Again, using um, uh, TLS 1.3 um, and a set of certificates, again, associated with the right instance of, of your Netscope security cloud. So the user clicks on an app or they, you know, as I did, I typed in a browser or I brought up um, Windows RDP, and essentially we get an authorization at the gateway, right? The gateway knows who you are based on the, the agent authentication. Um, it then looks in its policy to see if you have uh, the proper uh, access rights to that particular app. It discovers where that application is uh, via the publishers um, and Essentially, you can have multiple publishers. Um, you can do uh, HA publishers, load balance publishers, all that happens automatically. And then it actually creates a tunnel from the cloud to, uh, to that stitcher. We call it a stitcher. It's an internal name for where the publisher terminates. Um, the st stitcher pushes that to the publisher and then publisher resolves a local app using DNS and, and finally connects to the app. So essentially we're creating um, a secure tunnel uh, across the internet 
uh, to your private application within your data center or within an Azure v uh, VNet or an AWS VPC. So that's for zero trust networking with an agent on a GFE laptop. Um, let's switch back a second um, to the to this laptop. And you know, I talked earlier about zero trust networking and, and also about how we're pushing um, the same types of concepts for data. Uh, so let's take a look at how we might uh, do that for, for data as well. Uh, so on this, um, uh, one thing I didn't mention, um, sometimes we get questions about defining the application itself. And um, so I'll go back here and show, here's the application. Um, this is vSphere. This was the first application that I accessed. Uh, essentially, we create an application. Typically it's a host name. I'm using IP addresses. It's just easier for me to do this in my data center. And then the port that that application uses, um, and we we define that. Uh, we also assign a publisher to it as well, uh, bas basically letting us know where it is. Um, as I said earlier, we have we also have a tool that goes out and will find this information for you um, uh, about private applications. So if you have an application that you're that you don't know don't really know what ports it may run on, you can actually. I'll use it to discover that as well. Um, so once you've defined that, you can you can see that application here. So we'll take a look at um, how we can control data. In this case, we're going to use uh, we're going to use the Teams application, um, pretty popular application for sharing and collaborating, um, and we're going to. Uh, do a couple of things here to protect the data uh, within uh, within an enterprise or within a, an agency um, as we try to move this data with you know through Teams. So here I've got um, Teams set up. I've got my my partner Brian Leedy here in, in chat. So essentially, I'm going to upload a sensitive file um, to this chat. Um, Here's my sensitive file. It's got PII in it. And uh, essentially I get a notification. Um, and this is you know, from the client itself, from the Netsco client. Um, and in this case, it's a coaching page. So it's actually telling me that this is a DLP violation. Um, it's allowing me to justify the usage if I wanted to or report it as a false positive and I could proceed um, or I can stop. And you can create whatever type of message and action you want here. Um, so if I want to just block it completely, um, I can do an appropriate message um, and not allow the user to proceed. Or um, if you want um, some sort of banner that's that's official, you can put that in there as well. Um, and we record the justification used here is, um, in the actual information as well so that you can go back and, and follow up with that if necessary. So essentially we blocked this sensitive, sensitive data from being uploaded. So we'll continue on. So I'm in. I'm still in Teams here. Um, you know, there's multiple ways to do this within Teams. So let's take a take a look at one of the other methods. Let's actually uh, start a meeting. And uh, take a second to join. I've got a meeting up and of course in the meeting, you also have the ability to do chat as well, right? So we got chat here and then we'll, we'll, we'll do this, we'll essentially do the same thing. Um, it's a little bit different. I'll point it out uh, when we go through um, the logs, but a sense I get the same type of a message, right? Um, this is sensitive information. If you wanna proceed, you can justify your usage, otherwise you could stop. Um, and let's say as an example, I really want to get this information to Brian. So I'm going to go pull it right out of uh, a spreadsheet that I have. And I'll basically paste it into the, in, into the Teams messaging 
tab right here. Um, and we get the same or similar information, right? So um, it's a little bit different. I'll go through that in a minute, but, but essentially we're blocking sensitive data um, from, being, from being shared or uploaded uh, through Teams. So let's take a look at what actually happened here um, and some of the, the information that, um, that you can see. So if I go back to my, my instance of Netscope, we have something called Scope It, which essentially is uh, uh, where our logs and events sit. And we'll look at, we'll look at the application events here. Um, so if we go down, what the first thing that um, I'll kind of point out that, and you know, under the covers, Teams is actually using uh, OneDrive and SharePoint as well. Um, and so you'll see that here. That's why this is a 365 off Microsoft Office 365 event. And I'll, I'll show you, kind of show you that um, in the data that we pull at the same time. So this is my, you know, this is here I am, my, my client attempting to do an upload. The little orange there is an alert. Um, so here's all the data that we get. Um, right, so eventually, essentially, there's the policy that it matched. It's a user alert. That was the box we got. And there's the object. Um, and the other, the other pieces that we understand a little bit about the application. Um, this is a Teams app. And then for, in this case, we came from, the user came from the Miami data center or POP. Um, we have other use, user information as well. Um, if we look here, we can see, you know, obviously a layer three information, but also whether the device classification, I don't have device classification configured here, but um, it would have told me whether it was a managed or an unmanaged device may have taken different policy based on whether it was managed or unmanaged. Um, but the other piece that I tend to focus on for a lot of government agencies is the application. So we understand the application um, at the API level and, and we're reading the JSON. Um, and so why that's important here is that there's different instances of, in this case, this is OneDrive, you know, 365 OneDrive for business. And if you notice, it says Netscape zero is the instant ID. This is from the vendor from Microsoft. And then there's an instant name and this is our tag. So we understand the difference between different instances of teams in this particular case or Office 365, and we can create different policies around that. So that's important, you know, because you might have different versions or different instances within your own agency. Some agencies, um, they, they're kind of surprised to find out that there's multiple instances that, that different groups have, you know, subscribed to, and it allows you to A, see that, and number two, or B, uh, actually uh, control it, um, you know, and, and kind of have documentation that, hey, we've got multiple instances, we, want, we need to know about that. But more importantly, most of government agencies have contractors on site, um, and they might be using their particular version of O365 as well. And so we have the ability to not just identify, but create policies around that. So I could create, um, you know, a policy for the government agency to do, um, you know, DLP checking, looking for sensitive data. Um, and uploading that, but for the actual contractors, you know, whether it be Lockheed or, or Boeing or whoever, maybe we don't allow them to do uploads at all, right? Maybe we don't allow them uh, to attach things to 365. We just allow them to read their mail as an example, but, but not actually move data in and out using those instances. Um, so that's a, that's a capability that we've had for, for a while that um, is, is actually pretty difficult to do. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. The other things that are here is we have something called a cloud confidence index. That's um, we basically uh, stack rank, if you will, um, about 35,000 different cloud applications today. And, and um, we're looking at the business side of the, the, the application, what the company is, um, and then vulnerabilities within the cloud application itself. itself and then we create this index. So you, you can create dynamic policy based around that so that if it falls below a certain level, maybe you start warning the user or you, you don't allow them access to that at all. So we know the activity. Um, we know all the activities because we understand the API and JSON at a very granular level. Um, and you know, we can create, we create policy around that. Um, also from a DLP perspective, um, 
This is what you're seeing here. We have a, in this case, we're using a best practice PII DL profile, DLP profile. And, um, you know, this is basically a social security number. And that's, you know, to be frank, that's probably not that difficult, right? There's probably a lot of folks who do that, but let me just take a second to talk about um, some of the other things that for DLP um, that we can do, because it's kind of one of the other uh, big strengths of Netscope. Essentially, um, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but um, you know, two things is we have over 3000 identifiers, 1500 different file types that we're looking for both in line, you know, as data is moving in and out. And also we, um, we can also do it at rest via API. Um, but the other piece I think that's important here is we've started doing this ML enhanced classification. We did this, started doing this about two years ago. Um, and what we're finding is that that's actually starting to be more accurate than the typical, you know, DLP type solution where you're doing, you know, regex or advanced regex or, or pattern matching, if you will, right? We're actually teaching our ML to actually recognize different types of data and then take action. We can take action on that policy. So as you see here, passports, driver's licenses, um, credit cards, those are the, you know, the things that you would normally expect, but we're also doing things like tax forms, resumes, um, uh, some government forms we're adding. And we have the um, something called our train your own classifier that allows you to look at your data and start training the ML model to understand your data so that when you see something that's uploaded that matches uh, the ML criteria, um, that might be you know a form that's within your agency that's sensitive, um, we can match on that as well. Um, and we also have exact match too, where we basically fingerprint um, either fields and databases or sensitive documents as well. But I just wanted to kind of jump out a second and show that, you know, this is the other area where zero trust principles should start being applied on the data side, not just on the access, because, you know, the data is, you know, probably the more sensitive piece. So again, that's our, that's our DLP information there. Um, and then moving forward, we'll see, um, about that already. Yeah, this is essentially the instance. Uh, the one piece I didn't mention there is you can actually name that instance whatever you want instead of using the vendor's ID because sometimes the vendor ID is uh, is very long and uh, not very readable. Uh, I'll move ahead a little bit here. The other piece is typical layer three information that you would see where, where the client is, where the server is. Um, so that was for the first one. And now I won't go too depth in the, in the next two, but the, the, the second time we did this, it's actually the thing that I point out is it's actually a different, technically a different application. Teams is actually, um, it's actually using SharePoint in that particular case. Um, it's using a SharePoint server to actually try and upload that file that we blocked. Um, but the same thing, it has its own instance and instance ID again, um, and we'll, we'll do policy based on that as well. And then lastly is the Teams itself, um, where we pasted it into the actual team chat. You can see here that's um, it's my Teams instance, if you will. And again, we do all the same, all the other information is very similar. It's just a, a different application. So that's uh, zero trust for data, if you will, um, with a pretty, you know, a fairly, I would say complex app um, from a collaboration standpoint where you might share data. Um, we have that, that same capability for activity controls, all of that um, available um, in, in about 33 different applications, I mean, 33,000 different cloud applications today. Um, so things like, things you would expect like Box, Dropbox, O365, obviously all of that, Google, the Google Suites, um, Salesforce.com, um, Workday, ServiceNow. Um, it's because we understand that they, you know, the API and JSON that they use that we can apply those principles. Um, so one of the other things, one of the other use cases I wanted to go through real quick was 
generic web browsing or browsing to risky sites. Um, so one of the SASE capabilities that was that I showed earlier was something called RBI um, or remote browser isolation. Um, and essentially this is the ability to um, via policy to actually have a, a website not get rendered on your local machine, but actually get rendered in our cloud. And then we send you a pixel stream of that data. So you might do this for risky sites. You might do it for uncategorized sites. You'll create policy around it. Um, and on when you activate it, we tend to call it targeted RBI because we don't want to do it for everything, but we do want to do it for sites that, that, you know, that don't meet the right risk criteria that are, that are risky to us. So in this particular case, I, uh, I developed an RBI custom category. Um, so it might have risky sites in it, uncategorized sites in it. Um, I, put, uh, I put a test site, ICAR, everybody knows ICAR in there as well to just kind of demonstrate um, RBI. Um, and then the action for this particular rule, instead of being allow or is uh, to actually do an isolate. So we're gonna isolate the browser, meaning we're gonna, we're gonna actually render that browser in a container instance on our system and then provide a pixel stream of the data rather than the actual HTML, the raw HTML from the site itself. So a couple things here. Um, I opened up a new browser tab and I went to ICAR and you can see this asterisk here. This indicates that this is an isolated um, website, if you will, or an isolated session. Um, and so um, it's actually not being rendered by Chrome on my browser. It's actually being rendered elsewhere. And then, and then sent, I'm being sent a, a pixel stream of what the representation looks like, um, including links, by the way, the links, uh, um, are in there as well, they're, they're obfuscated. But essentially here is the HTML and a couple things here, I'm not a, uh, uh, a coder anymore, but um, you, know, you can see how this is our, our isolation technology and um, it's, uh, it's about you know, 65 lines or so of, 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 of HTML. So it's uh, not a lot of, uh, on the actual client side. Um, so let's just take a quick look at what it would look like if we didn't run the RBI, and you'll see you'll see the the difference. So we'll just disable the policy um, and apply that change across the system. Um, when you apply a change like this, um, you know it actually syncs across all the data centers. So it can take a, you know it took a, a minute or so. Um, to get distributed. So I'll move ahead a little bit, see if I can. I think in this case, I recorded this. So I think it took about a minute. There we go. So now we'll go back to that website. Right. Back to ICAR and notice there's no asterisk, right? This just looks their normal, um, the normal website. You don't see the asterisk there. And if we go back and we look at now, we look at the HTML. You'll see that it's all the typical HTML you would see, right? It's a that's a ton of a ton of code that's getting pushed to the browser. So the first case we are doing an isolation, and this is normal. Um, so kind of again, it allows you to you know if you have a particular group of users, maybe they're in HR, maybe they're um, you know, in IT and they need to, to go to particular types of sites that may be risky. Um, it's a great way to, to eliminate a lot of that risk by having it uh, reviewed locally. So let me, I'll just jump real quick over here and just kind of show you a, a little bit of a diagram. This is a relatively new capability for us about, uh, I guess, 30, 30 to 45 days out now. We've been working on it for a little while, but we deployed it, uh, uh, I think, about 45 days ago. But essentially, using our secure gateway, um, when we hit a particular policy that's risky, we use an isolate instead of an allow. We, have, we spin that up in a, in a containerized environment within our system, and then we send the actual browser, a pixel stream of the data.
So the last thing we're going to talk about is client lists network access. So everything that we've been doing up until this point has been with a client or so it's what I would call a GFE device where you've installed the client. Um, you can also install the client on unmanaged devices as well. We have a, a method for doing that so that the first time a user logs into a service that requires the agent, it'll actually redirect them to a download page. It'll, have, it'll authenticate them and all that. Um, some of our customers do that, some of them don't. Uh, it's, it's really dependent on their, their posture. Uh, but also we wanted to provide services for, you know, personal devices that don't have access, you know, you can't load a, uh, an agent on or, or you don't want to load agent on essentially. Um, and really it's, it's very similar to, uh, and uses the same components as our, our normal ZTNA, right? We've got the publishers on the right hand side here connected to the security cloud and we've got a remote user, um, in this case, not using an agent although that shows an agent there for some reason. Um, and what we typically do is redirect you when, the, when you go after that service, uh, when the user clicks on that service or types it in their browser, we actually redirect you to uh, an IDP for authentication first um, so that we, um, we get you authenticated and we can get your user and group information. Um, we know you're an unmanaged device um, already um, and that'll, and then we can, based on that authentication information, we can then, you know, either grant or not grant access to that particular uh, service. So let's take a quick look at that. So this is a, a, a personal machine. It's a personal laptop. There's no, um, no agent installed on this particular one. Um, and we're going to go to um, the same data center that we talked about before, um, the data center up in DC, where I've got um, a couple of services running and I have one of them using this client list. So one of the things that uh, the client list um, service does is it actually um, generates and publishes um, a host name for that application on our service. Um, so you can use your own custom host name if you'd like um, just to make it easy, I use the one that we, uh, that we, that we generate and you can, you can see that here, it actually has the, the internal IP and port, um, but it's essentially going to my tenant within Netscope and then the, the clientless, uh, redirection takes over from there. So I'm not exposing that, um, that service to the internet. I'm not opening a port. I'm actually using the, I'm still using the publisher. Uh, to gain access, but first I, I log in with my IDP. This is um, this is Okta as an example, and then once I have once I'm authenticated there, um, I reconnect to um, the service on that uh, from that host name, and then it actually gets me to the application that I want. In this case, it's a uh, one of a couple different firewalls that I have on the inside um, that allows me to to access that firewall without without needing a client or VPN, um, it, you know, it essentially gets me access to that device. Um, so very similar to the, the client, um, other than the fact that it's using, um, it's, it doesn't need the client and we're redirecting that to a reverse proxy service on the Netscope platform. So those are the use cases that um, we talked about um, earlier about demonstrating. You can, um, I've got uh, other use cases as well that uh, with videos with talk track on the video as well that are um, that are on the huddle site. So there's a um, there's about four or five other types of use cases um, that we support for zero trust there as well that um, that you can uh, take a look at at your leisure and that'll be in this presentation as well. Um, so with that, I will. Uh, I will open it up to questions. Or shall I answer the chats first? Hey, Scott, this is Brian. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Yes, yeah, so we, uh, we have a couple of questions, uh, and perhaps maybe you got some uh, directly to you. 
as well. Um, so there was a question back during the, um, the Zero Trust Network Access or Netscope Private Access. Um, I believe I answered it appropriately, but the question was, uh, does, does it block all network connections and routing? Um, and I think it, the question came in at, at the time where you were talking about uh, how the publisher works and such. And um, I said, yes, it, it blocks, blocks um, everything unless you specifically, you know, allow something through it. Um, That's correct. Yeah, at the, at the service level, um, everything has to be uh, specifically allowed. Um, you have to define, you have to define the application and um, and then create the policy to allow it. The, the one, uh, just to, to make sure we're not confusing, the one other element is at the client side. So the client is acting like a, is, is redirecting traffic, right? So it's, um, that is also configurable. So um, when you create an application, a private application for ZTNA and you create rules around it, um, the client actually is looking for that host name um, or IP address, and it will steer that host name or IP address to Netscope. Um, for other, there are cases where you can have, you can go to other destinations or other applications um, and it not be steered. So if there's something, if there's something local, like a local printer, or there's other types of applications that are, you know, that are on the same network, that, those, that type of data, um, uh, is typically configured not to be steered, although we could block that as well if we if we wanted to. Yeah, so this is Chris. So I asked that question, and the, really the kind of the idea that I was getting at or concept is we have a in in a network environment we have a challenge, obviously, with a couple different things: uh, lateral movement if the if something's compromised, right? So moving off the box and attacking other things, um, but. Also, command and control, if the box is already, and I'm talking the, the client side, right? Right. Um, it, you know, command and control, if the box is compromised, right, unknowingly um, through advanced persistent threats. Um, and then being able to do things that might get you compromised while you have that persistent connection to a trusted source, right? So... Um, i.e. you have an admin that logs in to do administrator work on a server, but they still have access to their email. They still have access, you know, for a phishing attack, um, access to the web and going to a bad website that they then get compromised while they have that trusted connection. So that's, that's why I was asking that, you know, that question is, you know, because in, in to me, the best approach is, when they log in to do a specific role, i.e. administrator or data admin or business analyst of some sort, they should only really have the software available to them to do that and the connection to that. Um, everything else, you know, in a zero trust should be untrusted connections at that point. So that's, that's why I asked that question. So it sounds like it's possible to uh, establish that trusted environment. So uh, yeah, you would... That, that would take a little bit of coordination, right, between your IDP and the application as well, right? Because so you'd want single sign-on to be across. So in this particular case, we have sort of three entities, right? Three, we have the client, we have the Netscope cloud, you know, security cloud, if you will, and we have the application. And all three need to be using the same authentication token at the, you know, for to do what you're talking about and so and sometimes that happens right sometimes um, and then sometimes it doesn't where you know you've got like in the case of my demo i had to i had a second login right to get into both of those applications um rather than using if you're using a single sign-on across all three then we, you could do exactly what you're talking about i could limit you to um just those applications that the admin wants i i, I wouldn't i would you know deny you the ability to go to email um, the only, you know, the only caveat with that is it doesn't, uh, I'm not preventing you from running a local email client, right, and drop, you know, and doing things like, you know, bringing things that way. Um, DLP can catch that, but, but um, depends on, you know, depends on the application you're going to. Yeah, I think, 
I don't know if you if your agent has a capability to do software whitelisting, but something like that would be right good um, enhancement to say. Because my my biggest concern is why does a why does a data analyst or a financial analyst need to have access to all the administrator tools when they're doing right. their stuff? I mean that's part of the part of the security concerns that are there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, as, as long as we're using the same um, username infrastructure, be, meaning that, you know, an admin is an admin and the finance want, you know, you're logging into all three of those or, or, or we're representing that same user across all three of those. I think you can do that. Um, and we do have the ability to whitelist by uh, essentially process, um, if you will, um, as well. So that's, you know, we, we can, we, you know, we can help there as well. Um, it's obviously... Um, I think, as you said earlier, there's some coordination between these apps that has to happen. Uh, I think you're getting that on the IDP side. Um, it's these legacy applications, I think, that are a little bit more difficult because they're not using the SSO. You know, they're not using the same authentication in some cases, like especially older devices. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll keep harping on that with, with RPM as well. So the other question I have is respect to DLP, how would DLP work if the data is encrypted end to end? Do you have the, we want to take the so, so we're doing break and inspect um, for cloud applications today. Um, so anything that's that's going to a SaaS application as example, we're already, we're doing that for, um, we're not doing that um, for ZTNA today. Um, there's a whole host of, uh, reasons why that's difficult. Sometimes those applications have their own private certificates. Um, so you'd have to load your private cert onto our service um, to do that. Um, it's functionality we are building, but uh, how it how it gets rolled out and what it looks like yet, I don't have a, a good feel for. Um, uh, but but you know, as, as I showed you, the Teams app, as an example, is completely encrypted. So we're doing break and spec for all that. Um, so anything that's cloud-based, we can handle that. Uh, for targeted RBI, can users choose when if a URL is viewed via RBI? Uh, da, 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 da. So we're, we do that in policy today. So in your example, um, if the um, if the URL matches the phishing category, so you know we take in forty different feeds from uh, from IOCs from from different folks um, to help us on the threat side of things, so we can identify you know phishing sites or phishing URLs and that is so if it was if it was to come up as a phishing URL or I think more importantly if it were to come up as uncategorized so meaning we don't have a category for this URL then yeah then we could write policy to do that um, right now we don't have the user doesn't have the ability to to do it on their own although I think that's actually something to consider I hadn't really thought of that um, to have a switch for I want to view this via, I mean, you could easily build a portal to do that, but um, it'd be nicer to have it right in the browser. That's actually a pretty good example. But today it's only set by the administrator to answer that question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, is this cell TLS encryption inline or out of band? It's it's done inline um, across the platform. So um, yeah, that's already been answered by Brian. Thanks, Brian. Um, Okay, that's I'm um, through the chats. Other um, questions or discussion points? Um, you know, I try I try to, to take this with a zero trust in mind, right? That's really kind of what the the working group is is after. So the part of that is you know ZTN access to your private apps. Um, the other piece though is also let you know we're all going to the cloud, right? Most I think most of the agencies are probably doing something with 365 as an example. Um, so we, we need to focus on focus there as well. And like I said earlier, one of our strengths is on, is on the DLP side, being able to, to look at different types of data that, you're, that your users are moving up and down and, uh, and, and take action against those. Um, okay, other... Scott, so I think we'll take some verbal questions if there are yeah, any. Just say, yeah, I'm through the chat. So any other questions? Uh, Feel free to unmute yourself and fire away. Nothing? Anything, Brian, you want to add? 
No, Scott, uh, you, you covered um, everything. I, I felt very well. Um, unless there's other questions, you know, it's one of the challenges of doing this right at uh, noon Eastern time. Folks probably have food in their mouth as well, but that's uh, quite all right. Yeah, with that then, I guess we'll wrap up. Um, I, like I said earlier, there's some other uh, use case uh, videos um, with TalkTrack in the, in the Huddle site for Netscope. So you can take a look there as well. Um, and uh, where there'll also be some other information in there too. Thank you very much, Scott and Brian uh, and the rest of the Netscope team. Thank you also to Jimmy at ISEC7 from the previous demo. Both will be posted as recordings on the ATARC website. And uh, thank you to all the attendees for joining us today. We hope to see you all again next week, same time, uh, 11 o'clock Eastern. <laughs> um, thanks and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.